linear programming. Uh, again, the originality of this lecture is zero. Uh, I am following Vandenberge. Uh, this is a course of 12 lectures or so, which you get compressed into two hours. Uh, omitting his examples and using, using uh, mine, which, uh, which are more relevant perhaps to image processing or pattern recognition. So uh, linear programming was invented starting in the 1940s and it played a great role in uh, planning of uh, or allocation of shipping resources in, in the war effort. Uh, it was later also important in, uh, in organizing the planned economies in the East. Uh, it, it didn't save them, but it wasn't the fault of linear programming. So linear programming is good. And it was later used in control theory and, and so on. Um, I'm going to first give you three forms of linear programs. And we'll then give a couple of examples saying why this is interesting. And then we will see how to optimize these problems. So the general form of a linear program is to minimize C transpose X over variable variables. Those are multiple variables X such that AX is less than B and GX is H. And X is a n-dimensional vector and we have a total of m constraints involving these up to n variables, inequality constraints and we have p equality constraints. This is the general form then there is the inequality form, which we've seen before today. Which wants to minimize C transpose X such that AX is less than B. And finally, there's the standard form. There's a bit of confusion, so different people call different things the standard form. But the convention that I'm using here is the following. There we go. And by the way, this name, linear programming, uh, predates programming and computers. And uh, this funny terminology permeates the whole field. So there's linear programming and quadratic programming and so on. Uh, these are just, you know, conventional or names that convention has uh, adopted for problems that are linear or quadratic in their objective. Now, I will, I will soon show that all of these forms can be translated to each other, but let me start with an example first. For example, let's say we want to do a Laplace regression or median regression or L1 regression. And not only that, we also want it to be monotonously increasing. So I'm looking at the following problem. Let's say we have a set of uh, explanatory variables V, which are assumed to be without error. And I have a couple of observations. And I now want to obtain an estimate that on the one hand is as close to the data as possible and on the other hand is monotonous. So as close to the data <coughs> as possible uh, would mean that uh, probably here I would 
put my estimate right on the point. Here, I would somehow compromise between the conflicting information. So lower this point a little bit and increase that one a little bit to make sure that the whole thing is still monotonous. I am, of course, guessing all of these uh, numbers now. Okay, and I have some deviation, let's say here, there, there, and there. And I want to, let me call the uh, observations, let me call these zi, and let me say that I have estimates yi, and I want to find the best possible estimate, so I want to minimize over y. And this time, I don't want to penalize the square deviations as we did in least squares regression, but I want to minimize the sum of the absolute deviations subject to, in addition, uh, a monotono monotonicity constraint. So I want yi to be no less than yi minus 1. Where the points have previously been ordered. So that is not part of the optimization problem. I assume that I have previously ordered the points such that So this corresponds again, like in least squares regression, to the assumption that my feature v is measured without error, and I only want to correct vertically in this other direction. Okay, so we we don't really obtain a regression. You know, I, I could now say, oh, okay, let me connect this or let me interpolate linearly, but really I only get uh, predictions exactly at those places where I have measured things. And uh, getting such monotonous curves, you know, is sometimes important in uh, in uh, control or when you want to uh, um, steer an engine or, or things like that. Okay, so here's our problem. Uh, but if you remember, you know, general form, inequality form, and so on it does not yet look like any of these. So what do we do? So there's a, a standard trick, namely to uh, use more, to introduce more variables. So I can reformulate this problem and uh, reformulate my constraints. So I could say I want my yi to be as close as possible, my estimate yi to be as close as possible to the observation zi and this uh, discrepancy between the two I am expressing as uh, a positive discrepancy uh, psi i plus and a negative discrepancy psi i minus and I want these discrepancies to be non-negative. These are slack variables, and taken together, psi i plus minus psi i minus just gives me the difference between my uh, true observation zi and my estimate yi. Now, I still want to have this uh, monotonicity constraint, so I still want to have yi minus yi minus 1 to be no less than zero. And 
I'm now looking for, well, the simplest possible explanation. Let's say if there's a difference of 1 between yi and zi, I could write this as plus 1 minus 0, or I could write this as plus 2 minus 1, or as plus 3 minus 2, and so on. So this is, so far this is ill-defined. However, I can now um, take the sum and put them in the objective function. This time with a positive sign. So I want to make the sum of my slack variables as small as possible. And I minimize over both the original variables, y, and my new, my auxiliary, vari auxiliary variables, xi plus and xi minus. Also, this is quite typical of linear programs. You see that uh, y still appears. We, this is still a variable of our optimization problem but it's actually no longer in the objective function. It is only implicitly found through the relation along with my slack variables to the original observations. And uh, minimizing the slack variables will also give me optimum values eventually for these estimates. Any questions? So if we forgot about the isotonic, if we forgot about this motronicity constraint, this would be Laplace regression, which as far as I know was even proposed slightly before um, the normal least squares regression that Gauss uh, put forward. Uh, but it's numerically a little bit harder because for least squares regression, well, we solve a linear system of equations and here, as you will see later, we need somewhat fancier algorithm in the course of which we need to solve multiple linear systems of equations. Is that clear? Then I want to give another example. Namely, Earth moves distance. So imagine the following problem. You have uh, goods at a couple of sites. Uh, let me uh, show by the size of the arrows how many goods we have, or by the size of these patches how many goods we have. This is the goods that we have. And then somewhere else, um, there is goods that we want. Let's say that much here and this much here. I'm assuming that we're in the perfect world here. So the sum of the halves is the sum of the ones. And now we have a cost associated with transporting a good from one location to the other. and um, do not interpret these positions that I showed as uh, Euclidean uh, or as positions in Euclidean space. I just want to say we have four have and four want, and we now have a cost associated with each of these arrows here. So the haves I will call, I will say these are masses i, and these are once i, and then I have costs uh, dij, or cij is perhaps better for cost. I have cost cij for transporting mass from somewhere to somewhere else. And I'm assuming that the good is the same. And I'm also assuming that it does not you know, suffer uh, during the transshipment process and so on. So this has uh, many, r 
many applications in the real world. Of course, you can use this for logistics problems. Uh, but actually, this is also quite important in image processing, where one of the important things that you need to do is to compute a similarity be between objects. And this could be um, uh, populations of different histogram bins. So we would have one histogram with four entries and another histogram with four entries. And we would want to know, well, how similar are these two objects characterized by the four histogram bins? And if there are just two objects, there's no point in doing that. But if you have one query object, let's say uh, this is an image of something, and then we have uh, thousands of uh, possible objects to choose from, and the task is, for example, to choose the most similar object to our query, then uh, you could do things like compute the chi-square distance and so on, and that works all right. But it turns out that the earth movers distance is actually a very, very good uh, dissimilarity measure. And here's how you can compute it in terms of a linear program. So I want to minimize product of flow going from I to J, so a flow of mass or of product, times the cost of transporting something from I to J. My optimization variables are now all these floats, flows, and I need a um, couple of constraints. Could you give me a the constraints that we need here. So I want to move all the mass from the top to the bottom. These costs have been specified by, you know, perhaps you have computed how long does it take to transport it from here to there or something like that. So the C's are specified, the, the F's are what we want, yes? The C's are given, yeah? Let's assume that these are given, okay? We're looking for the flows F. Yeah, exactly. So uh, flow has to be non-negative or non-negative flows. Why? Um, yeah, and the thing is, so let's assume that this is flower. I cannot transport, you know, negative flower or something like that. So, um, yeah. So if I, uh, so I want to admit only flows from the first set to the second set, and then I need them to be positive. OK. Yes. Um, yeah. This is uh, what I uh, postulated. But um, so let's say that the mi and the wi is already given initially. Uh, so this is indicated here by the size of these uh, circles. So we want some constraints on the f's. Exactly. Yeah. So I could say that this means that I want to uh, fully deplete 
each bin or each store of uh, goods that we have. So the flow, sorry, that's an error here. Um, the flow going from I to anywhere has to sum up to the mass that I originally had there. And then you said the other way around also. So the sum over I, Fij, has to be Wi. Um, so that means fulfill each request or something like that. And uh, this entire thing was under the assumption that we have given the cost Cij and that we were also given the W i and the mi or I'm using a different index here for this different set and here we argued that uh, we're in the perfect world and we have no leftovers and no unsatisfied need you can uh, you know, you can easily omit this condition and then you, you get a, an extra condition on your earth movers distance. Yes, that's true, but in addition, uh, you would then, if you did just that, if you just converted these two inequalities, if this doesn't hold, then there would be, can you think of a trivial solution? Don't move anything, it's cheapest, yeah? uh, but you haven't satisfied any needs. So, so you would get an extra condition that says, I want to move at least uh, you know, the smaller of uh, the entire wanted mass or the entire available mass. Yes? Excuse me, how about? Yeah, if we introduce a cost for unfulfilled wants, wants or needs, then we don't get an extra constraint. That would also work. Yeah, would perhaps be more natural. Okay, so we've seen um, two problems and there are many, many more. And now these letters have been different and so on. But, uh, you know, all of these have been written as uh, in, in one of these forms here. And uh, for the second problem, it was very easy. For the first problem, we had to, if I look again at the first problem here, this one didn't look like any of our examples here. But introducing these auxiliary variables, I could say that my objective function is now the same as uh, now I can say my cost vector here is just a vector of all ones. And then I have the vector of all psi i pluses and the vector of all psi i minuses. Um, so that would work to express it in, in the desired form here. Okay. So next, I want to show how to translate these uh, forms uh, to each other. I want to start by general to inequality form. So I start out by saying I want to minimize C transpose X. I leave the inequalities untouched. And now I had these equality constraints. And the equality constraint that GX equals H, I can rewrite them by saying GX should be both less than or equal to H, and it should be more than or equal to H which amounts to saying that, which we had in the general form. And that is the same as saying that I want 
inequalities which sound you know smaller than or equal to so I can rewrite this as I can multiply with minus 1 and that gives me minus gx being less than or equal to minus h now my inequality sign looks the right way around and to really bring it into this form of having a single set of inequality constraints I can say I want to minimize it such that and now I need to summarize these three sets of equations or inequalities into one which I can do by stacking the matrices There we go. And while we're at it, I want to give another translation of forms before turning to the geometry. So let's say we want to translate general to standard form. Again, I start with minimization of C transpose X subject to I originally had AX being less than B and less than or equal to B and I now use an equality and add a slack variable. So that amounted to my original inequality which required that AX be less than or equal to B. And in addition, I still have my equality constraint, GX equals H. Now, these, it's not yet in the, the standard form. My standard form should look something like minimize C tilde transpose X tilde such that g tilde x tilde equals h tilde and I want that all my variables are involved in this uh, that all variables are restricted to the positive authent and in this case here only my slack variables are restricted to the positive authent so I still want to rewrite this in a way that involves all variables and as before I can take my unconstrained variable and now rewrite that as a sum of two constrained variables. So I can say that this is the same as minimizing C transpose X, or sorry, X I now replace by X plus minus X minus. Such that A of X plus minus X minus plus S equals B and G of X plus minus X minus equals H. My slack variables must still be non-negative. Now we have the new constraint that each X has been decomposed into X plus minus X minus both of which have to be non-negative. Okay, and this problem, I can now summarize in matrix form as follows. We write new cost
with zero elements because my slack variables do not appear in the objective function. And here I stack all my variables. Instead of the original x, I now have x plus and x minus and my slack variables. And you see that uh, this taken together will be my c tilde. And that taken together will be my x tilde. And I can, in a similar fashion, stack or rewrite all of my constraints by saying that a minus a and i, g minus g and 0 can be grouped to give me a new matrix g tilde, which can be multiplied with the same vector x tilde to give b and h. So this is now g tilde, and that is h tilde. And then finally, I have the constraint that x tilde should be larger than zero. So each of these forms, uh, the standard inequality and general form, they can uh, all be translated into each other. Now, to get a geometric intuition for all of this, it's easiest to work with the inequality form. So the geometry of linear programming in the inequality form. We're minimizing C transpose X such that A X is less than or B. And I am now using the convention that my M by N matrix A is a collection of row vectors. I'm always a bit unhappy to write row vectors. But anyway, here we go. So these are the individual rows of A. And taken together, these constraints define a polyhedron. which is the set of all points x for which ax is less than or equal to b, or written in terms of the row vectors, it's the set of all points x for which the ith row multiplied with x is less than the ith element of b. This holds for all m rows. So to give you a 2D example, let's say that this is A1 transpose, A2 transpose, A3 transpose, and A5 transpose. And I have my origin somewhere. Let's say origin is here. So if I take A1 transpose times x plus b equals 0, this is exactly this set of points. And if I'm getting out value smaller than 0, it means that I'm on this side. Okay, so uh, this first constraint says that the feasible region must be in this half plane or half space uh, that's opposite to my normal vector. And that holds for every other uh, of these rows. 
So my feasible set overall is going to be this. And note, by the way, that uh, here this constraint A4 was useless. Uh, it could have been deleted from my linear program without changing anything because it does not have an effect on what my feasible set looks like. So this is a polyhedron, which happens to be our feasible set for this linear program here. Now the interesting points in the polyhedron are these extrema, or these vertices. And they have, uh, or they can be characterized in three different ways. You can think of them as extreme points. And these extreme points, the corners of your polyhedron, extreme points are defined as follows, that they cannot be written as a convex combination of two other points. So they cannot be rewritten as x equals mu times y plus 1 minus mu times z, where mu is restricted uh, to lie between 0 and 1. And y and z have to be inside the polyhedron and they must not be the same as the point of interest x. So this is a, a long equation. It simply means that uh, if we take, let's say, this point here in the middle, I could write this point as a convex combination of those two points that I have marked. And for extreme points, this is not possible. For extreme points, I would need a point somehow outside the polyhedron, which it's not allowed to be. Uh, so extreme points have neighbors or have no neighbors on, on one side. That would be one way of saying this in words. So those are the extreme points. And they are the same thing as the vertices. And a vertex has a different definition vertex x of a polyhedron fulfills the following requirement, namely that uh, there exists some cost vector d such that the cost of all other points is uh, strictly lower than the cost associated with our vertex. And that should hold for all other points in the polyhedron. So let me sketch that in more detail. So let's say this is the feasible region that I'm interested in. And let's say I now have a vector d which is pointing in this direction here. Then I can associate with this vector d something like equicost planes, or I can, uh, I can draw equicontour lines where all points, let's say all points that lie on the green, on these green lines, um, they have the same inner product with d because they project to the same position. And there should be some vector d pointing away from a vertex into the inside somehow of this polyhedron which fulfills this property that uh, all other members of the polyhedron when projected on this direction, 
give a larger inner product. And I think you've already, you know, just by looking at the picture, you've already, already understood what is a vertex of a polyhedron. But anyway, here's a third definition. which is the terminology that's most frequently used in conjunction with a simplex algorithm. It's called a basic feasible solution, which we have if for n unknowns, a point x is a basic feasible solution If I can uh, write a matrix A bar, which I'm going to define in a moment, with rank N, with A bar being defined as B times A, A is the constraint matrix that we've seen, and with B a diagonal matrix the ith element of which states if uh, constraint number i is active or not. So this is the indicator function. It's 1 if its argument is true and it's 0 otherwise. And the argument here is that ai transpose x is exactly equal to bi. So this evaluates, uh, this indicator function evaluates to one if the ith inequality is tight. Because note that we have an inequality here. So we want that ax should be less than or equal to b, but here we write a strict equality. So uh, this thing evaluates to 1 if the ith equality is tight, which is the same thing as saying that the ith constraint is active, which is the same thing as saying that the ith constraint is binding. So in other words, I uh, built a matrix A bar which holds only the rows of A of those constraints that are active. So for example, in this point X here, it would be the constraints A1 and A5 that are binding or active, whereas all others are not. And uh, this gives me two unknowns for this two-dimensional plane here. So uh, rank two, uh, that's enough to specify my point here. Okay, so these linear programs, at least in inequality form, are always associated with such polyhedra. And we are looking, we have a cost function, C transpose X, so a, a linear cost. And we're looking for an extremum of this cost over the feasible region, over the polyhedron. And I think you already have an inkling that this is going to be in a corner. So let's look at um, the normal case. We have a polyhedron. And a feasible region. This is the feasible region. And I have a cost vector that's pointing, let's say, in this direction. This is minus the cost vector. And I want to minimize C transpose X. So to minimize C transpose X, I, I could equivalently say I want to maximize minus C transpose X. So I'm looking for a point X that is lies as far as possible in this direction of minus C. And 
just as I sketched before, uh, this induces uh, equi contour lines which are orthogonal to this minus c. So these are all orthogonal. And well, the, the best point that I can possibly find is going to be in this corner here. So this is going to be the optimum value or the optimum point that gives me the optimal value. So this is the normal case. Can you imagine a degenerate case? Exactly. So uh, if I have a constraint set, let's say I'm using the same cost vector, but I have a different constraint set. Then all of these points here, which I'm drawing in bold, are going to be uh, equally optimal. So this is going to be the optimal set. set of all points which are feasible and which give us minimal cost. And then can you think of another case? That is perhaps more strange. Uh, this is if we have a feasible half line. So uh, let's say. You know, we, have, we have some polyhedron, uh, but it leaves uh, it leaves a half space open, and my cost vector is still pointing in this direction. So by moving along this direction, I can uh, obtain infinite rewards or infinitely negative costs. And this is called having a feasible half line which is given by so feasible means that x0 where we start uh, plus td for a non-negative t is feasible And if we build the inner product with uh, this cost vector, we get out something smaller than zero. Or because I've always drawn the negative cost vector, I could say that minus, minus C transpose D should be larger than zero. And in this special case, the optimal value that we find is minus infinity. Now, the normal, c so in this case, I would say you have uh, probably, you know, misconstructed your entire problem. Either something is wrong with your constraints or uh, you've messed up a sign or somewhere. So, so these are the, the normal cases. Okay, so um, coming back to this sketch here, we, are, we have our feasible set. We have our negative cost vector, which is perhaps pointing in this direction. So the optimum solution would be here. 
and the obvious question is how do we find it? Uh, and that is the subject of the simplex algorithm, which we'll talk about after the break, uh, after first establishing some uh, dual properties.